section of our technology all works here and we have mr tom is our moderator and thank you guys for being here to make sure we can use this wonderful technology during our time of COVID to be efficient uh also well we'll get into that after mr zepp is done uh mr zepp the floor is yours thank you good evening mr chair senator costello and senator kawasaki wherever you may be my name is gary zepp senate finance staff to senator wilson and before we begin, I'd like the opportunity to briefly go through the materials in your subcommittee binders. The binders were distributed to senators on the committee and their staff, the Department of Revenue staff, the Office of Management and Budget staff, and the Legislative Finance staff. I won't go into great detail for each section, but we'll point out some highlights as follows. Each of the binders should include Legislative Finance's budget subcommittee books. The books contain a wealth of information, including a light blue report that summarizes all of the governor's FY22 budget requests for the Department of Revenue. Legislative Finance does a great job describing each transaction in detail along with an analysis, as well as an allocation summary, agency totals, and transaction detail reports for each appropriation and allocation within the department. Tab 1 contains the overview pages directly from Legislative Finance's fiscal analyst overview of the governor's request. And the highlights include a short fiscal summary comparison between FY21 and FY22 budget as proposed, a more detailed fiscal summary comparing FY21 management plan and supplementals, and the governor's FY22 budget proposal, as well as projected reserve balances for FY21 and FY22, an executive summary that also includes narrative on the on Alaska's long-term fiscal challenge, Alaska's fis fiscal situation in FY22, an overview of the governor's FY22 budget proposal, fiscal modeling based on the current situation, a recap of the FY20 session and the governor's supplemental requests, and a host of other great data for your reference. Tab 2 contains departmental historical graphs summarizing FY12 management plan through the governor's FY22 budget proposal. Tab three in your binder, this contains the Department of Revenue's prior program priority table. It describes whether a program is constitutionally required, federally mandated, and or statutorily required. Tab four in your binders, this section summarizes the FY21 significant budget issues for the Department of Revenue. Tab five, this provides a summary of the FY22 governor's budget proposals for the Department of Revenue. Tab six, if applicable, it contains any content language, excuse me, any intent language that the legislature included in the appropriation budget for the Department of Revenue. There isn't any intent language for the Department of Revenue from last year, so that tab is blank. Tab seven includes the Department of Revenue's FY22 budget narrative from the Office of Management and Budget. It includes their mission, performance measures, accomplishments for FY22, key challenges, and other information. The last tab in your binder, this section will include a summary of the department's general fund program receipts, but this section is under construction and will be updated at a later date. In summary, the presentation shown tonight is available on the legislature's homepage under the tab daily schedule and this is available for all legislators staff and members of the public thank you very much to the department of revenue staff the legislative finance staff and the office of management and budget staff for making this wealth of budget information available to all of us hopefully the hearings will convey what services and activities the department of revenue provides what those services and activities cost and what services alaskans can expect from the department of revenue Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. As uh, Mr. Zepp stated that these uh, documents are available on basis. Also want to let you know that uh, um, staff from Senator Kawasaki's office came. Mr. Hayes is with us as well, representing that office. And thus, uh, we can get into the presentation. Uh, first, I just want to uh, thank folks that are online and just want to ask Commissioner Mahoney if she's there to provide some comments before we begin. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
staff of the committee. This is Mike Barnhill, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Revenue. I'm standing in today for uh, Commissioner Mahoney, who can't be with us this evening, uh, but appreciate the opportunity to say a few words about the Department of Revenue as introduction, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, our Administrative Services Director, Mr. Brian Fector, and he'll take us through the slides. Uh, Mr. Chair, the mission of the Department of Revenue is to collect, distribute, and invest funds for public purposes. It's been my honor to serve as Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Revenue. I'm in my now third year. Uh, in the past, I have advised the Department of Revenue as an attorney at the Department of Law, and I've been a staff member in the Division of Treasury as an investment officer. So it, it, it's an, indeed an honor to, to sort of graduate up the, the chain to Deputy Commissioner. This past year has been an extraordinary year for the Department of Revenue. I mean, uh, at a minimum, it, it was extraordinary because of the extreme challenges that we faced uh, under the, through the COVID pandemic. Uh, in mid-March, we began to move all of our staff out of the office. In, in the space of about three weeks, we were able to get close to 80% of our staff working from home, working productively uh, with uh, secure remote access to the systems that they needed so that we could continue the work that we needed to do. In our child support section, uh, under our uh, category of collect uh, funds for public purposes, we set a record this year in, in collecting and distributing child support. Um, for our permanent fund dividend direct, uh, division, they distribute permanent fund dividends. We paid the per permanent fund dividend last year three months early, uh, which took an extraordinary amount of effort. We're very proud of that team for getting those funds out the door on time uh, three months early without any difficulties. Amazing effort on their part. And then in our Treasury Division, we invest uh, the, the assets of the PERS and TERS retirement systems, as well as state funds. And this, uh, contrary to everyone's expectation, has been an extraordinary year for investment. And our returns right now, knock on board, are quite high. So it's, I'm proud to be here before you today, Mr. Chair and, and staff members. Happy to answer questions, make sure that you get the information you need in order to adequately consider our budget. And I'm going to now hand it off to Mr. Fector. All right, before uh, Mr. Fector begins, uh, and you know how much I really appreciate you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Barnhill, and I really appreciate you being here uh, for this. But, you know, I was just, last year we were sort of snubbed by Commissioner Dagny Mahoney, and this year, you know, I would have been, t I would have taken a pre-recorded message just saying hello and hi and not saying that it's going to hurt her chances of confirmation, but it does definitely doesn't help to not see a, a commissioner designee uh, leave pro provide a statement on her, of her own for the first subcommittee. And I just, you know, just put, throwing that out there. But before uh, Mr. Fletcher begins, we don't need to go over each mission of each department that is here for us to read. If we can just go through some of the major changes and accomplishments and the challenges, I think that would suffice as we go through the slides just for speak of ex expediency. All the committee members have had this committee for the past two years and they're well knowledgeable of uh, very experienced legislators and their staff to uh, to understand this. So if we can just stick to the uh, to those type of items as just we're reviewing these numbers. The special interest are in control like what happened in the House today on the finance so, committee. Uh, before you get started, Mr. Chair, I take very seriously your concerns and I was certainly conveyed on and I just express um, a deep apology to the committee. And we will make sure that Commissioner Mahoney appears at the next hearing and provides some comments to you. Thank you. Mr. Fletcher, the floor is yours. And also, if you can, for folks that are following along, if you can just let us know what slides you're on, that would be helpful too as we're going through the slides. If you can just tell us what page you're on. Sounds great. Uh, for the record, my name is Brian Fector. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the Department of Revenue, and um, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting us here to do a department overview today. So if we get, could get on to the uh, second slide. Um, I won't spend too much time here um, other than to just sort of uh, show our mission to collect, distribute, manage, and invest funds for public purposes, and to sort of echo uh, the fact that 
not only do we have a number of core divisions that you can see here with their associated core services, we also have administrative oversight of a number of corporations, such as the uh, Alaska Housing Finance Corporation, such as the Permanent Fund Corporation. And so we like to sort of mentally account for uh, the two sides of the department differently, just for the fact that uh, the core divisions only have about a fifth of the funding and a third of the positions. And, just, you know, generally a big corporation like uh, APFC with a $150 million budget can really dwarf a division like the tax division with a $17 million budget. And if we could move on to slide three. Uh, this shows a little bit of where we've been. Uh, this is UGF and DGF, general funds over time. Uh, you know, if you were to pull this table out for, you know, almost any department, you'd see a familiar story. In that red dotted line, you'll see the uh, oil price over time. And so, you know, what ended up happening is when oil shot up over 100, we started doing some interesting one-time things. You can see that big year in 2011. Uh, when we gave a loan to Galena, we had gas line costs, we had expenses related to a uh, education bond offering. And in the years subsequent, you see sort of a steady march upwards. And then very suddenly, the uh, price of oil collapsed from over 100 to ultimately settling at $26 in 2016. And so we had to sort of start to get serious about cutting at that point. And so we've made some calculated reductions. Uh, our UGF is down 7.4 million or 22% over that time. And total general funds, UGF plus DGF is down 4.2 million, 12.4%. So that's a, that's a pretty sizable, uh, sizable haircut. And I'll just draw the comparison where if you look at fiscal year 2022 and you compare that to fiscal year 2009, we're essentially flat even though it's been more than a decade and there have been significant headwinds in the form of employee inflation increases, COLA, um, and all sorts of other fixed cost increases. So that's, that's really a, a testament to how well the department is uh, holding the line. Now, if we can go to slide four, this is all of our funds. Uh, and it paints kind of a different picture. Now, anyone who knows me you know, knows I'm a bit of a budget hawk. So this is probably the only time you'll see me championing a uh, graph that looks like this because the bulk of the growth is in that black bar. That's our other funds. So that's the permanent fund receipts, that's the retirement receipts, um, which is all a good thing because we're spending more uh, to invest our money because we have more money to invest. In 05, the permanent fund was just under 30 billion. Now it's in excess of 70. In 05, the uh, PERS and TERS retirement trust funds were at 12.7 billion. Now for the first time ever, they've exceeded 30 billion. And so that's, that's 136 and 147% growth over that period of time. So, of course, our, our management fees will have increased over that time. If we can go on to slide five, and for the, the rest of the presentation, we'll essentially just be walking division by division. You can see the tax division's mission there. Some of the recent accomplishments, uh, they've continued to support their many tax types with their many taxpayers. They were able to implement safe procedures to allow for regular cash collection. The committee might recall that the marijuana taxpayers uh, are largely unable to get bank accounts. So they have to come to our Anchorage uh, vault and our cash room and essentially paying cash. Uh, fiscal 20 was actually a gangbuster year for them. They counted $25.6 million in cash. And we're expecting in fiscal 22 for that figure to be $32 million. So it's really nice to be able to echo a revenue increase, especially amid COVID when we're, all we seem to be talking about is revenue shortfalls. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, we're in the midst of implementing REMI. REMI is a economic impact modeling software. And so the whole intent of, um, of this new software is to allow us to answer some of the more difficult questions that uh, the legislative committees and the public have been asking. And so once we're fully trained up on the system, uh, the tax division will be able to answer some of the hard questions like, what does a PFD reduction do in compared to a reduction to the Department of Health, for instance, which would cause more economic activity loss, which would cause more job loss? And additionally, you know, if uh, the legislature begins considering certain revenue measures, we can do a comparative analysis of those as well. So we'll keep the committee apprised as that moves forward. Challenges, there's a uh, continued emphasis to get ahead on our oil and gas production tax audit timelines. We just finished fiscal 2013. We're almost done with fiscal 2014. 
and we believe that we can get to a three-year cycle by fiscal 23. And that's, uh, that's a positive thing because to the extent that we can get ahead on these oil and gas tax audits, uh, that returns money to the general fund, that returns money to the constitutional budget reserve, and in a year where, where we are um, a little bit cash-strapped, it would be good to, to get ahead on, the, on those audits and be able to recover a little bit of tax money in the process. How, how far are we behind on those audits? Uh, we are sort of simultaneously working on, I believe it's 14, 15, and 16, but I can have the, the tax director provide a detailed update of exactly where they are in the process. Yes, please. Thank you. And just a, a more statewide note that we're continuing to manage through reduced revenues as a result of COVID-19. Uh, I'm sure everyone realizes we didn't have a cruise ship season, which means we uh, collected zero dollars in cruise ship head tax, zero dollars in cruise ship gambling tax, and numerous other tax types are have been significantly reduced. So we'll continue to monitor that situation moving forward. On to slide six. Uh, you can see the budget over time. Uh, major budgetary changes include cost recovery of shared taxes. Currently, the state collects various taxes on behalf of communities. So we're proposing to assess a 1% fee effectively on those, uh, those tax collections before we forward the revenue. So just as an example of the impacts, Anchorage receives about a million and a half annually. We would charge them 15000 And Goon receives $800 annually. We would charge them eight. Uh, so just a little bit off the top there. Also, we're deleting a vacant imaging operator. Uh, you can see the number of paper returns has been greatly reduced. And I think the uh, IT staff over in the tax division deserve a lot of credit. Uh, their tax portal has become you know, very user-friendly and it has really steered people to want to use that rather than doing paper returns. We're also deleting a vacant appeals off officer. Uh, this is due to uh, fewer appeals cases at the officer one level and more appeals cases rising to the officer two and three levels. So the, the work volume at the one level is really uh, uh, much lower and we think we can manage without that position. I'll also uh, note, because the committee has been asking about general fund program receipts, the tax division actually has about $800,000 worth of general fund program receipt authority. The source of that is the uh, uh, gaming licenses and uh, the gross receipt tax from uh, pool tabs and other other charitable gaming activities. Collections are about two and a half million a year. They spend about 800,000 a year, as you can see here. And so that balance is, um, is lapsed to the general fund every year. And Mr. Flood, and I, I, yeah, Mr. Flood, can you tell us if these positions were uh, sort of, are we laying off positions? Are these terminated positions? Or are these people moving to other positions in the departments as you go through these slides? Um, I, I will do that. The, the imaging operator is vacant, um, and I, I believe the appeals officer is vacant, too. I'll double-check that. Thank you. And for, for each of these slides, I, um, I also like to do a little performance metric. So this is audit hours over time, and I think the tax director has done a great job of sort of refocusing the auditors to do productive audit work. Uh, we found that over time they've sort of collected a lot of administrative uh, side type tasks um, you know ancillary to their audit duties so as to the extent that we can get them refocused on auditing um, you know that's that's a positive step that can uh, close out those audits in a timely fashion on to slide seven uh, the Treasury division you can read their mission there and I'll pause just a moment on this first bullet under accomplishments uh, they've done just a really tremendous job of uh, doing a real assessment of their outside money managers and seeing which high-cost money managers really aren't providing the return we need to really justify the cost. So they've been able to retire a number of uh, outside money managers, and they'll they'll be able to. They've actually been able to save 30 million in investment management fees over the past three years, which doesn't necessarily show as a UGF reduction of our budget. But if you go to the retirement statewide item. Uh, that will be reflected uh, there in future years to the extent that we can continue to, to save those funds. I'll also note that the uh, retirement funds, PERS and TERS, are at an all-time high of just in excess of $30 billion, so that's very positive as well. Uh, you can see they're meeting 26 out of 28 uh, uh, benchmarks for their non-retirement funds as well. 
and unclaimed property, which is uh, administratively housed under the Treasury Division, uh, has been able to return $24.2 million in uh, unclaimed property to uh, Alaskan owners over the past five years. Some of the challenges, uh, and we've been uh, meeting with some of our colleagues in other states. Uh, I just met with Nevada PERS the other day. Um, we're all talking about the challenge of maintaining those return expectations. Uh, a lot of people are saying in this low interest rate environment with bonds barely paying 1%, uh, it'll be challenging to have these years of six, seven, eight percent return. And you know how we sort of react to that. We're in an ongoing investigation. Do we change our asset allocation? Do we take on more risk? You know, do we start to discuss a small amount of leverage? And so those conversations are currently happening um, uh, with the uh, arm board and internal with the treasury division. Also of note, uh, the cash management function is housed under the treasury division. And as the CBR balance uh, slowly declines over time as a result of our systemic deficit, uh, we'll need to look at some other options because the CBR really has been our source of uh, working capital over all of these years. And to the extent that that nears depletion, um, you know, we need to look at maybe commercial paper, uh, revenue anticipation notes, uh, things of that nature. So on to uh, slide eight. The biggest uh, budgetary change of the uh, Treasury Division this year is going to be that we're um, uh, we're going to be billing uh, the cost to uh, manage the funds to the four largest uh, endowments that we have here at the state, and so it'll be a 10 basis point or a 0.1 percent charge to each of the PCE public school trust, higher ed, and international airport funds. In past years, these were sort of shouldered primarily by the general fund. It was just sort of subsidized by the, the general fund there. So we'll take a $1.4 million reduction and we'll add DGF and other fund sources um, to supplant that reduction. In terms of a uh, performance metric, we always like to have a friendly uh, rivalry between the Treasury investment folks and the uh, investment folks of the permanent fund. You can see uh, PERS and TERS over a five-year basis earned four point or 6.46 percent. Permanent fund earned 6.44 percent. So, you know, we're we're ahead a little bit there, and uh, we in fact were able to do it at a at a lower um, uh, management fee level, 43 basis points as opposed to 58. So, we're doing a lot a lot of great uh, work there in the investment section of Treasury Division. On to slide nine. Uh, we'll start with the PFD division. Uh, everyone knows their mission and what they do. Some of the biggest accomplishments they've had, they were able to do the July 1 uh, early PFD distribution. Um, they took a reduction last year uh, of five employees, seasonal employees, um, that won't need to be brought online due to use of technology. Uh, they have a, a new piece of uh, technology that will read the manual paper applications and do the data entry in lieu of these staff, so that's positive. And they're also seeing a reduction in uh, paper applications, which, as we all know, the paper applications are what drive the, the data entry and the scanning and the uploading and all of the manual work there. So to the extent that we can lower that percentage, that's a very positive thing. They also held a uh, successful PFD raffle. Uh, we reached out to the uh, four winners this past week uh, and let them know that they, they were the lucky winners. Uh, this year we had $983,000 donation, in donations. That's up 13%, even though the PFD this year was down 38%. Uh, also of note, um, at the beginning of... Sorry, sorry about that. I had the, uh, the maintenance person coming in to take the trash. Um, when uh, the pick click give, or rather, when the PFD raffle was set up, uh, we heard some um, some concerns that it might crowd out the pick click give program, and so we actually found out that that's not the case. Uh, pick click give donations are about level at 2.6 million year over year, so it's very positive as well. Uh, some of the challenges in the division: uh, navigating IT and logistical issues for non-standard distributions. Uh, there's a proposal out there from the governor to uh, make the Current fiscal year's PFD whole. There's a, uh, a a number of other um, proposals out there about the doing an early PFD again, things of that nature. Um, and also, we're continuing to sort of analyze uh, how we can improve our processes, what regulations are getting in the way, how can we automate manual processes, 
you know, just as a small example, uh, we noted that there was a regulation out there that required um, new PFD applicants, and there's 40,000 of them a year, to actually print their signature page and mail it in to us. So they would complete their application fully online, they'd get to the end where they needed to sign, and they would have to print out a piece of paper, put it in the mail, send it to us, and we'd have to scan that and upload it. Um, and so it's things like that that we're trying to look at to see if we can get rid of some regulations or, you know, some, uh, you know, improve our processes in some way. And so before you go on to the next slide, uh, you know, previous year we had a situation with the whole IT technology side of the applicants. Uh, we're about a month and a half into the PFD applications process now. Any hiccups or glitches thus far? No, none that I've been uh, made aware of, so I think it's going pretty smoothly at this point. Wonderful. Through the chair, I'm sorry. That's wonderful. Thank you. So on to slide 10. Uh, the PFD division also has uh, general fund program receipts. The source of that is a 7% uh, charge to pick click give donations. And um, additionally, there's a uh, small fee. Uh, I think it's $125 or so. That's uh, charged to each of the nonprofits so that they can get on the pick, click, give list. And so we send that entire amount out to the Alaska Community Foundation every year uh, for them to manage the, the granting out of that money. Uh, one budget change for the year, PFD technician is being deleted in the appeals section. Uh, we're seeing fewer appeals and uh, you know the manager there was able to get some operational efficiencies going so we can uh, uh, delete that, pos that position which uh, I believe is, is filled, but will be vacated soon due to a retirement. Uh, you can see the reduction in paper applications. Again, that's very positive. That uh, that really drives our manual manual work that the division has to do. And you can see the cost per PFD for each year. Now, 2020 was a bit anomalous because we had to effectively determine two cycles of PFD eligibility in a single year. So we were able to utilize those federal CARES funds to uh, add a number of non-permanent staff um, to the division to assist with that eligibility function. On to slide 11. Uh, this is the Child Support Services Division. Um, biggest accomplishment, they were able to get off a uh, very expensive mainframe server and uh, transition their system to a less expensive hosting solution. Uh, that saves over uh, $1.1 million annually, and that's savings already achieved. You'll see that as a budget reduction um, on the next slide. You can see the number of paternities established. And uh, another uh, thing to echo is their collections are significantly increased from prior year. You can see $122 million versus 106. And that's largely due to, A, the federal stimulus payments, which are garnishable, and, B, the uh, enhanced unemployment, that extra $600 a week that... Uh, all the um, folks on unemployment insurance were receiving uh, uh, this past summer. Some of the challenges they're having, um, it is a shop full of entry-level employees. People move in and up quickly, and so they, they have uh, quite a bit of turnover. And uh, they want to attempt to uh, automate some of their manual processes. Uh, currently, they're on an old green screen system uh, that's very inflexible. Uh, and we found that over time, the uh, system is really dictating uh, the processes that they have and creating a lot of manual processes, rather than them trying to uh, find the most efficient process and uh, be able to manipulate the system to accommodate that. And so uh, we can discuss perhaps at a later date the uh, capital request that they have to uh, replace their system, uh, and they believe that uh, once that's implemented, they'll be able to sunset um, 28 um, office assistants and lower-level staff uh, through attrition. I'll go on to the, the next slide. Yeah, um, uh, actually, I'm going to take a quick ID here.
Er, back on the record. Sorry for that brief eddies there. Not a problem. We're on slide. So we're on uh, slide 12, I believe. Uh, you can see their uh, budget there. They indeed, too, have uh, general fund program receipts. The source of that is uh, paternity testing. Uh, so if a um, non-custodial parent is tested and it turns out that parent is not the father, then uh, the, the general fund and uh, federal budget uh, take on that cost. But if it turns out that uh, the individual is the father, uh, they have to reimburse us for the cost of that paternity test. And so uh, we spend every bit of our or GFPR in that section. Uh, major budget changes, I've mentioned the server savings. Uh, we're also deleting two vacant positions that have been uh, unfilled for uh, well over a year. Uh, so no, no impact there due to the, the vacant positions. And we're also uh, uh, reducing a uh, IT position and we're proposing to fund that uh, through capital instead should we uh, uh, receive that request in the capital budget for uh, system improvement. In terms of uh, you know various metrics, you can see in the bottom right, uh, you know all of our numbers are going in the right direction. The arrears, the amount owed in arrears is going down. The arrears collected is going up. Uh, total collected is going up. Uh, so that's very positive. And then in the box on the left, you can see our cost effectiveness ratio. How much money do we collect for the the parents and the kids for every dollar that we spend to do it? And so the, the people to beat are uh, Wyoming and North Dakota. You can see they collect seven dollars per dollar spent. We're at about three seven three. The U.S. average is five oh six. And this is a really important metric because it is one of the metrics that feeds into our federal incentive payments, which you can think of as effectively a bonus payment that the federal government gives us for being cost effective and for meeting certain benchmarks, such as you know establishing. Um, certain certain levels of paternity, collecting on arrears cases, uh, things like that. So to the extent that we can reduce the budget, increase our cost effectiveness ratio, it may have a multiplier effect of, of an indeterminate amount so that we can offset even more unrestricted general fund with uh, federal receipts that may come in. On to slide 13. This is my division. We uh, support the department as a whole with all of those back-end functions. Our biggest accomplishment is we were able to renegotiate our federal indirect cost allocation plan, which lets us charge the federal government for a certain level of administrative services. And that will generate 107.8 thousand of additional federal receipts, which means we can uh, take that as a UGF reduction, um, knowing that the federal government will now shoulder that cost. Uh, we're continuing to provide services to all of our Divisions, uh, we're assisting with process improvement initiatives. Uh, one of our uh, one of our biggest challenges actually is a, a new initiative for an enterprise risk management uh, program. And so the whole idea here is that uh, we have significant assets at the Department of Revenue. There's 30 billion in the retirement fund. We give out you know anywhere between hundreds of millions and billions of dollars a year in the permanent fund dividend. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars you know go in and out of unclaimed property, child support, you know, there's, um, we have a cash room for collection of the marijuana cash. And we, we really thought it prudent to uh, be able to really assess our risks and put together mitigation plans as to, you know, what are the best procedures for the cash room? You know, what would we do in the event of a, a cybersecurity attack or a ransomware attack? And so to the extent that we can have someone who's fully dedicated out to looking at our risks, and preventing them before they happen, you know, I think that's a very positive thing. You know, a, a, a week can't really go by at this point where we don't hear about a, a university or a state or local government that's had a ransomware attack and, you know, has to pay millions of dollars to unlock their financial systems. And we're also um, going through the, uh, the process of uh, working with the Department of Administration on all of their consolidation efforts for HR procurement and accounts payable. I do, on to the next slide. Yeah, before we go on to the next slide, I do want to talk about sort of the uh, consolidation efforts. You know, some of these uh, make sense, and I know all departments, um, you know, I was told by another uh, former commissioner of labor, current legislator, uh, made mention of 
HR is sort of different in different uh, aspects of different departments have different requirements, which you may need to find some of the special special skill sets. And we've been through consolidation, deconsolidation. How is this uh, working for the department in terms of uh, workflow and being able to make sure that you can acquire the staff that you need in a timely manner uh, and have a productive sort of uh, process? Uh, Chair Olson, uh, for the HR consolidation in general, um, I think that's that's really going fabulously of, of all the consolidations. I'd say that's probably the, uh, the best and most well thought out one um, that I could point to, and I, I need to give just tons of credit to Deputy Commissioner Holland over at DOA as well as uh, Director Sheehan. Uh, they've done a really great job. And the thing to understand about HR is that much of it was really standardized from the get-go. So, you know, they had a, an easier time um, really getting everyone together, uh, right, because the, the process to do a recruitment, the process to uh, process uh, evaluations, many of those processes were already standard across all of the departments. Uh, you know, it's, it'll be a little bit more challenging for procurement to come up because every department does procurement differently. And so, uh, you know, they, they have the benefit of not having to struggle through the uh, standardization of all those processes, you know, across uh, 14 or 15 or however many departments we have out there. Thank you. So slide, slide 14, I'll just really go let you look at it if you have any questions. Uh, you know, there's, I think I've already talked about everything on this one and we can skip to 15. This is the criminal investigation unit. Uh, they do uh, a lot of work in enforcing our uh, civil and criminal violations of, uh, you know, our tax laws, our PFD laws. One of the biggest accomplishments is they were able to transfer a portion of their investigative work to the DHSS tobacco investigation team. And now the DHSS team uh, really goes from tobacco retailer to tobacco retailer. Um, really enforcing underage laws. So they, they bring a minor in, they attempt to make a uh, cigarette purchase, and if that purchase is made, there's you know there's a fine and sort of education process that happens. Whereas we go into the same retailers, we're going to all the same places every year, um, and we say, let me see your uh, cigarette cartons, and if they have tax stamps on it, we know they're, they're good and they've uh, paid their taxes. If those tax stamps are missing, you know, we know something suspect, and we can confiscate those uh, those cigarettes. And if if there are enough to reach a criminal complaint, uh, you know, we go from there. So, knowing that we go to the same places every year, we figured we could save some travel by us taking the Anchorage Matsu and DHSS taking the remainder of Alaska, including the the highly rural places that we we don't quite have the budget to go to every year. Some challenges, uh, there's really an increase in gaming violations. I mean, anyone who's been on Facebook recently, you know, you see these these little bingo games, these little raffles that are uh, happening on, on Facebook, but they are they are certainly violations of our, our statutes that, uh, you know, they don't have charitable gaming permits, they don't have a charitable uh, organization or a civic organization uh, that benefits from those profits. So we're continuing to monitor that and uh, as we see the more egregious violations we're uh, working with the Department of Public Safety on those. And so hey. on, on that note and I, I appreciate your other challenge of the PFD cyber investigations increasing um, and Deputy Commissioner Barnhill and I and I think Genevieve was also on the same call uh, trying to address this issue we reached out to the Department of Public Safety and they, and maybe they are prosecuting, but they basically told us that they weren't going to do anything and they said they maybe we're going to issue a press release to address this concern and they decided not to do that and they decided not to issue any prosecutions uh, to work any cases. And so I just didn't know, other than referring these uh, type of cases and gaming violations to the Department of Law, would the Department of Revenue issue some type of uh, public statement of, hey, this is illegal activity, you shouldn't do this? Or would you still refer that to the Department of uh, uh, of DPS? We're just, you know, we've had that conversation, was it December, early December? Somewhere around there? I just... Yeah. yeah. 
So, Mr. Chair, this is Mike Bornhill, and since that conversation, we've actually had uh, multiple um, conversations uh, between the Department of Public Safety and our Criminal Investigation Unit's uh, section head. Um, we've, uh, we have funneled some um, case information to them, and we believe actually that DPS is moving towards uh, considering an indictment. I can't commit to that, but that's my understanding at this time. We're, you know, we filtered through the cases that we know about. We've provided information to them, and uh, we're providing uh, case support. So stay tuned. I think that the, uh, they're going to move forward uh, soon on a case. Well, that's good news. Like I said, you know, this um, our office still gets uh, contacted by a lot of uh, upstanding charitable uh, entities, nonprofits, and uh, they are very concerned that this is eating into their goodwill efforts that they are or community service. Uh, of funding which helps their uh, missions out and they just want to make sure that all Alaskans follow the law so I just want to make sure that we can help folks who may not know that this is illegal activities by just seeing disclaimers on Facebook so I just want to put that on the record too that I just try to help educate folks it just means more when it comes from a credible source on law is like the DPS or the Department of Law or Department of Revenue so I really appreciate your credibility of uh, mentioning that this is, uh, you know, these are gaming violations. And, and Mr. Chair, if I could just take a moment to explain sort of the process that we're trying to follow here. I, I, I am reluctant to come um, to move forward with criminal remedies before we've tried civil remedies. And so what our gaming section is doing is when these issues come to our attention, they're calling the organizations or the people that are conducting these unpermitted raffles and explaining our charitable gaming law and how they can get a permit. And if they don't qualify for a permit, they're advised that they can potentially find a permitted organization that they can conduct a legal raffle uh, through. Um, and then we wait to see if there's compliance and if there isn't then the charitable gaming section forwards that information to our criminal investigations unit and they follow up with another call it's a little more escalated in terms of uh, how we engage and and our criminal investigation folks say you know what you're doing is breaking the law and there are criminal consequences to breaking the law and we're advising you to stop breaking the law so that we don't have to forward your name to the Department of Public Safety and the Office of Special Prosecution. And then if that doesn't produce a result, then that gets escalated to DPS and the Department of Law. Um, and so we're hoping that this is a, a balanced approach to dealing with this issue. We don't want to overreact. Um, because there may be quite a few people, particularly since it's prevalent on Facebook, that just don't understand our laws and need to be educated and encouraged to comply. Um, and then ultimately, if we find a good case, if it's, you know, by good, I mean the Department of Law and the Department of Public Safety agree that it's one that is sufficiently egregious that should be prosecuted, the act of prosecuting a case uh, doing an indictment, issuing a press release, that has substantial deterrence value because it gets published in the media and then folks begin to realize quickly there are some pretty serious consequences to violating laws that have you know, criminal penalties. Um, and we, and it's that's where I think we'll start to see a little bit more compliance. Um, but we're, we're in that process now with with uh, our, our colleague uh, departments and, and we'll let you know when, when when those things move forward yep and i appreciate that and i think that is a fine plan and i can't disagree with that methodology so great job thanks for bringing this to our attention we appreciate that okay and move, moving forward i'll just make a, a short comment that we are seeing a uh, increase in uh, PFD cybersecurity uh, type incidents. Uh, there have been a couple brute force attacks on on my Alaska, which 
uh, thankfully our, our cybersecurity team over in OIT is uh, on the ball with. Um, and we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, increases in uh, sort of those duplicate PFD applications, uh, phony PFD applications, and those those are really very easy to identify uh, what's real and what's not. Uh, but, you know, it is, it is a, a point to make that we need to be sort of extra special vigilant, um, you know, moving forward uh, to make sure we're not paying out a PFD that we shouldn't. And I do have a question on everyone's favorite bill of uh, controversy of uh, voting fraud. Uh, with those uh, duplicate PFDs, that information still goes to the Division of Elections, and they are still registered to vote. Then, if they, if if, if you guys get multiple n number of fraudulent PFDs, do you flag the du Division of Elections and let them know, hey, this is not a you know. A registered applicant this is a fraudulent claim or are they still registered to vote and you guys just pass that information on to division of election as a pass-through you know i'm not sure uh, chair wilson i'm not sure the answer to that question and i can uh, follow up in writing thank you so slide uh slide 16 um you can just sort of see in the bottom left uh some of some of their metrics uh uh what they've done with various fraud tips, uh, you know, number of alcohol, gaming, and marijuana inf inspections that they've they've done throughout the year. So I won't won't spend too much time on this, and we can move on to slide 17. Now we're through the core divisions and into the corporate entities that are uh, residing in our department. First, we'll go to the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation. Major accomplishments: This is the eighth consecutive year that they've increased their operating income. Um, they have declared really a sizable dividend, $42.6 million. And this committee, as well as the uh, full legislature, approved a $500,000 federal increment last year. And they're putting that money uh, to good work. We now have uh, 41 people who otherwise may have been facing homelessness, individuals with disabilities who are now uh, in stable housing conditions. The biggest challenge with AHFC, um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, they received $164.6 million to provide rental assistance uh, to people who are who are out there who are either behind on their rent or utilities. And so that is a lot of money for uh, the corporation to get out on the street in a very short span of time. On to slide 16. Uh, you can you can see their budget over time going on that uh, top top chart there. Uh, I think one of the best metrics to show the health of the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation is the size of their dividend, because their dividend is based on the change in adjusted net assets. So as their assets grow, uh, so does the dividend. And you can see, you know, up significantly over this time frame, it was just seven and a half million in, in fiscal 16, and now we're, we're up in the 40s. Uh, so that's very positive. And you can see that uh, many Alaskans are taking advantage of the uh, low interest rates right now. So they've seen a, an increase in the uh, uh, loan origination, the, the loans that they purchase uh, uh, from banks. Um, so that's another positive for us. On to slide 19, Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation. Um, everyone knows what they do. Some of their accomplishments, they're at $71.7 as of the uh, middle of the fiscal year, as of December 31st. Uh, I pulled a balance just a few days ago, that's uh, 75.1 billion, and fiscal year through December 31st, that's a 15.74% return. Uh, so very healthy return there. Last session, the legislature gave APFC funding for a real estate asset manager, and that individual was brought on in uh, August and is uh, quickly becoming part of the team. Some of the challenges may sort of mirror uh, the Treasury Division. Uh, we're all sort of concerned about our, our ability to maintain that real 5% growth to accommodate the PFD, or the POMV rather, coming out every year. So we'll continue to mon monitor the capital markets and uh, continue to see what our consultants such as uh, Callan are saying about uh, ex expectations moving forward. On to slide 20, uh, you can see four main uh, budget requests from the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation. Uh, they're requesting a incentive compensation program, a global rates analyst uh, in this low interest rate environment. Uh, it's good to have a have someone who's really looking for uh, really undervalued or valuable opportunities in the fixed income space uh, because 
you know, when you're only making 1% on uh, long-term bonds, uh, you know, it's, it's really challenging to put together a logical portfolio that can meet your, your return expectations. They're increasing their revenue mat or their investment management fees. Uh, bigger fund means more fees to be charged. Uh, many of their fees are based on you know performance, and they have really uh, performed this past year. And they're also making an investment in systems. Uh, so this is going to be a, sort of a accounting and HR and finance type system that they're they're replacing. Over to the left, you can see consistently meeting meeting or beating the uh, passive index and uh, their performance benchmarks that they set for themselves. Uh, so very very positive uh, track record of success at the Permanent Fund Corporation. On slide 21, uh, this is the Municipal Bond Bank Authority. Uh, in short, what they do is they use the state's credit rating to get a uh, sort of preferential rate for our uh, municipal and uh, regional housing authorities and other entities who are wishing to finance capital projects. One of the biggest uh, issues uh, that's come to light over the course of the past year is that before we state the decision, um, we have a lot of uncertainty going on. If any, anyone remembers, that decision related to the state's ability to issue subject to appropriation bonds to fund oil and gas tax credits. And now the, uh, the decision was written just so broadly that we don't have enough clarity to know if the municipal bond bank activities are unconstitutional uh, as well as the oil and gas tax bonding um, authority. And so uh, without additional clarity from the courts, uh, the municipal bond bank is in somewhat of a indefinite holding pattern. On to slide 22, there's not much to talk about here. You can just see their their budget of a, about a million dollars, and the, the source of those funds is, um, you know, receipts associated with their bonding activities. Slide 23 has the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority. And right here, we're uh, gonna we're gonna take a, a brief at ease here. We'll go back on the record. Sorry for the interruption. You may continue. Yes, and so we're on uh, slide 23, the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority. Uh, they granted out more than $20 million, um, and you can see three of the, the focus areas that uh, uh, they diverted funding to over the course of the past fiscal year. Uh, the first item is substance use disorder treatment. Now, this is to uh, increase bed capacity at uh, certain nonprofits, uh, certain residential treatment uh, facilities. Um, you know, an interesting point of fact is that in the past, uh, the federal government imposed what's called the IND exclusion on the state, which meant if you had more than 15 beds in your facility, you could not bill Medicaid. And so the state actually just got an exclusion from that rule because if you go out and you look at these treatment centers, every single one of them has 15 beds because when you can't bill when you have more than 15 beds you're going to build right up to that limit and you're not going to build a bed more so this will uh provide some capital funding for set free aquila and seaview to uh, increase their bed capacity they also have a series of housing and homeless grants that are going uh, to covenant house 
to Bethel Winter House and to the United Way, and that's also for uh, renovations to increase bed capacity. They're also in partnership with the uh, Division of Behavioral Health over at DHSS, uh, really uh, assisting uh, as a funding partner for a lot of the 1115 waiver items that are moving forward, such as you know the Crisis Now model, uh, the 24-7 uh, uh, sort of psychiatric emergency response teams, the, the mobile crisis teams. So a lot of positive things happening at the trust. Some of the challenges, the long-term care ombudsman is administratively housed at the mental health trust. And just a lot of the travel restrictions and a lot of the COVID restrictions are really limiting their, their ability to really visit all of those long-term care facilities and, you know, and investigating, uh, you know, every complaint that comes up. On to slide 24, uh, just for your uh, situational awareness, you can see some of the categories of where the grants went. That's that $20 million in grants that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, I won't really belabor this, this slide too much, so we can move on to slide 25. Well, before you do, there is a comment here that said there's no major budgetary changes in FY22. So is this budget then the mental health budget, or is this the governor's budget, which utilizes mental health trust authority funding for other departments, like funding the uh, um, API? Uh, Chair Wilson, this is this is simply the administrative budget of the mental health trust. So that is the executive director, uh, all of the uh, sort of program officers and grant officers are administratively housed with us, whereas the grants themselves um, are really all over the map. There's there's money going uh, from their reserves to API. There's money going from their ordinary MTAR account to departments of health, a little bit to DOT, really, really all over the map. But I guess, you know, uh, we saw sort of, uh, you know, they sent us a letter concerned about their budget. Obviously, it's not really addressed here, but I'm just trying to figure out the best way to uh, to sort of get this answer somewhere on the record. And since their budget is being all, sort of, as you just explained, all over the map, um, maybe we can get... Uh, an answer from uh, your department or maybe ask them to uh, give us a definite answer on do they feel if their budget would be sustainable as a one-time draw is it healthy enough to take that type of deficit in terms of uh, the governor's proposed budget um, sort of a simple yes no answer uh, would suffice obviously their that continue draw on a uh, on a perpetuity would probably be damaging but as a one-time or a two-time, how, how, how long can they go on a draw in the governor's proposed budget before it becomes damaging? Uh, sure, Wilson. What I, what, what I would simply echo is that, um, you know, any amount you take out of a uh, endowment-type model today will decrease the amount available in future years. And so the, the general thought process over at OMB about the, uh, the reserve accounts is that the mental health trust likes to target a four-year year's worth of spending uh, sort of level in their reserves and currently they are uh, I'm, I'm gonna not not get the exact dollar dollar amount right but it's it's gonna be somewhere between five and six times their annual spend in reserves and so that they've really done well in the market uh, in recent years. They have half of their money invested with the treasury. They have half of their money invested with the permanent fund. Um, and so a, a one-year um, maneuver like this may help the general fund in acknowledgement that uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of mental health services happen through general fund spending every year. Um, but it's not something that we think we can do for a decade plus. Thank you. I'm not sure if Deputy Commissioner was going to answer or not. Um, I was just going to add um, this particular issue, the Department of Revenue has had no real involvement in, not, we didn't participate in the discussions or the decision, and just sort of an interest of staying within our lane because we typically don't get involved in decisions as to how mental health trust uh, funds should be spent. Um, it's really an issue for the Office of Management Budget and Mental Health Trust Authority itself to speak to. Thank you. Okay. 
So I'll move on to uh, slide uh, 25. So it wouldn't be uh, uh, session year 2021 without a COVID slide. Uh, some of the challenges that we're struggling with amid COVID, uh, I mentioned the $165 million in uh, housing and rental assistance. So that'll be a challenge for HFC to get out of the door. Uh, 80%, 86% of our department is currently teleworking. Uh, so that was a bit of a struggle at first, but uh, I really got to give the, the IT folks and um, everyone who helped on the logistics uh, just a ton of credit. Uh, we got everyone on, on VPNs and working from home and really just, just record time. And, you know, even though there was a little bit of a rocky start, to say the least, it's, I think we're, we're all getting into the swing of things. Uh, we also have a temporary allowance for online raffles. Uh, that would be your, your legitimate uh, charitable gaming. Uh, there's a lot of things that just can't happen amid COVID, for instance, you know, race classics and, and in-person gaming um, at bingo halls and uh, pool tab locations and the like. So uh, in order to continue to support our nonprofit communities uh, in this time of COVID, um, we're allowing for that online uh, uh, raffles to happen for them to continue to make, uh, make revenue for the populations that they serve. Uh, coordinating cash collections, I think I mentioned earlier, the marijuana tax, uh, you know, it's a bit of a logistical issue to always make sure that someone's available to take the cash, count the cash uh, when the, the taxpayers show up who are often not Anchorage based and are flying in uh, specifically to make that deposit. Uh, we're managing through formerly in-person encounters. Um, I think a lot of people have always been used to coming to the PFD or the child support offices and, and working through their issues. Well, it's uh, as we can all know, it's a, a bit, bit more challenging to do these things over the phone, so they'll continue to manage through that. Uh, one probably positive thing that I mentioned earlier was we have a 15% increase, and you can see that in that chart there, in child support collections as a result of the stimulus and unemployment uh, payments, which are, are both garnishable. Uh, general comment that COVID-19 is impacting state revenues. Uh, we had some positive news this week when the uh, new uh, Biden stimulus bill came out and uh, recommended a $500 million um, allocation to uh, the state of Alaska, which actually can be used to replace lost revenue. So should that actually make it to the finish line and pass, uh, you know, that'll, that'll help, you know. And uh, we've had to modify multiple regulations over this period to allow for uh, early PFD distributions, late PFD filing deadlines, late tax deadlines. Uh, so that has been a, a bit of an administrative process. And before we go on to the next slide, a couple of questions here. The 80% of the department teleworking, is that going to be a permanent uh, item or do you plan to uh, see that number go up or down? as the years go on or as the periods go on outside of COVID? Mr. Chair, Mike Barnhill, that is a great question. Um, and I don't have a good answer for you. It's something that we've discussed internally throughout this time period. We've, we have um, drafted contingency plans such as rotational schedules that might be more durable and sustainable over a longer time period where you have people come in you know, two, three days a week and then work from home uh, two, two or three days a week. Um, so we're ready to do uh, whatever um, the state as an enterprise decides to do uh, on a going forward basis. I would say in terms of long term permanent telework where people work at home 100 percent of the time, that's difficult to carry off. Um, and one of our biggest challenges in teleworking for this past year has been um, maintaining productivity, maintaining employee engagement and morale and continuity, particularly when you have turnover in, in terms of office culture and team spirit. Um, and so I, you know, I, I would say that whatever is decided, we will implement and we will do as successfully as we can. But there's some, you know, some pretty big issues that need to be taken up um, before we decide as as a state to telework permanently. And I guess my other uh, question here about COVID impacts is that we're coming up on a deadline. Uh, obviously, there's I. It might happen to extend the governor's uh, uh, 
emergency declaration, which a lot of the modifications and regulations that aren't listed on, uh, have, do you have a plan to talk to, let's say, the charitable gaming folks that that temporary item might go away here in the next few days? Have there been communication for other uh, regulations uh, to some of your uh, grantees or other um, taxpayers that some of these uh, regulations that have been waived may go away here in the next couple of days so that they're prepared to, uh, to, I don't know if the department's talked about that or how to plan to implement that. Yeah, Chair Wilson, uh, Mike Barnhill again, we do have a plan uh, a communication plan, which which we hope we don't have to implement, but yeah, regrettably, if the <coughs> emergency order expires and we don't have uh, legal authority to continue the online raffles, we're going to have to communicate to our permittees uh, that they that there's no longer clear legal authority for them to do that. Um, but I understand today, and I believe it's Senator Costello introduce legislation to continue um, online raffles, which um, was very gratifying to see. And um, my hope is that if we can't move forward on the, uh, the emergency declaration front, that we can move forward quickly on the legislation front. We hope so. That's a great piece of legislation and she's also on this committee and we'll pass that along. I think we're on slide 26. Slide 26. Um, so the last two slides here are more provided just for reference, so I won't spend too much time on it. It's just a little bit of, uh, you know, where, where we've been since the uh, price of oil collapse and since we've uh, started to talk uh, reductions. Uh, you can see the tax division. Um, the reductions have mainly uh, been positions because they are a very uh, people-heavy organization. Um, the film office was eliminated, so uh, companies can no longer claim the uh, film tax credit for uh, filming uh, pieces in, in Alaska, which, uh, you know, I've, when that happened, I, I thought we'd stop getting reality TV shows, but apparently that has not been the result. Treasury Division, a um, couple of position reductions you can see here and uh, a few maneuvers to uh, bring management in-house, which is usually uh, uh, less expensive than those outside managers. On to the next slide, the PFD division, um, all, all position deletions over the past several years, and the child support division, they've had a couple of office closures, so now it's uh, simply an anchor Anchorage-based uh, function exclusively. Um, some postage reductions and uh, shifting a uh, fee to custodial parents, and of course this year the big item is the uh, server savings. And so with that, I will uh, close my presentation and we can uh, entertain any questions from the committee. All right. Well, since uh, I think I am the committee tonight, I don't have any other further questions. Uh, and also for folks following along, there are two additional slides about the capital investment and supplemental. You don't have to go over those because we won't be addressing those really in the committee other than uh, you know, we try everything we do to have a, a real budget. I know some departments, they plan on a supplemental uh, in theirs, and I don't think you guys, uh, you don't do that in this. Uh, so they're just there for, for committee members and the general public just to see what some of the department overview is on the capital investment and what is uh, before the legislature a supplemental uh, request. Um, with that, I'll leave uh, any closing comments for uh, Deputy Commissioner. Oh, oh, sorry, here we may have a... Uh, uh, a quick question here. So I guess, uh, do you guys have a, a total cost uh, savings for uh, the child support division? Uh, Chair, Chair Wilson, for um, just uh, generally the uh, year-over-year -year budget change you're oh, requesting for, for closing their offices due to some of the efficiencies that have been seen with uh, more going to the electronic uh, yeah some of those efficiencies that you discussed earlier in the child care division yeah let me uh, uh, chair Wilson let me follow up on that one in uh, in writing so I can get you a detailed response okay thank you uh, with that we'll let a uh, 
Deputy Commissioner, if you have any closing comments that you'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you and the staff uh, of the subcommittee for hearing our presentation today. I want to just express appreciation for the uh, employees of the Department of Revenue. It's been a super challenging year, but they've all risen to the challenge. You know, these are the folks that invest our money, that collect and distribute the child support, get the PFDs out the door in a very timely way. We are just so super proud of everything they do. Uh, high caliber employees, uh, cream of the crop, and uh, and Brian Fector, our administrative services director, is an exemplary uh, person that represents the Department of Revenue. I'm so thankful for his presentation today and all the subject matter expertise he brings to the department. So with that, I will close and just say thank you, and we look forward to working with you to close out this budget. All right, thank you. I will echo your comments. I think that, you know, my past uh, few years working with this uh, department, I think all the staff have been on par, um, professional, uh, dedicated. You know, I was also hoping to see one of my former colleagues, you know, make an appearance one time or two, because uh, I really have so much respect for her. Um, and like I said, you guys are, um, I love all your staff from uh, Child Support Division and their efficiencies to the Permanent Fund Division uh, in, do, in dealing with uh, their technology upgrades with uh, especially the, the expertise you guys had to bring in last year to make that all work out and such efficiency and how fast that occurred. You guys have some really talented people in your division and I hope you guys can keep them on board as uh, we continue on with the next year. Thank you. So with that, that concludes our hearing from today. Our next meeting will be uh, Wednesday, February 24th at 5.30 p.m. at the same location, the Senate Finance Room and on Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry, not Zoom, uh, on our Teams meeting. <laughs> uh, we Thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you, uh, legislative staff, uh, uh, Mr. Hayes and Ms. McCall, uh, Katie <laughs> and Joe and Gary. And uh, we are adjourned at, uh, oh, and Tom. Don't forget Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we are adjourned at 6.46 p.m. Just one second here. Get things moved around. Going to make a little bit of noise now. <laughs> always fun to get to the wrap up all right today we got to hear from alaska's department of revenue and they were talking about all the different savings that they have done this year uh one of the highlights i guess you could look at it this way is that the covid care act and the extra unemployment that everybody has been receiving and the stimulus checks that that we've been receiving helped paid off a lot of the state's debt. Uh, parents out there that haven't paid their child support, these kind of things are garnishable under Alaska state law. So they had a 15% increase on what they have collected from uh, parents out there for their child support. Oh, excuse me, got something itching my nose there. And uh, so the, the, that 15% increase there is one of their uh, big highlights of the entire discussion. This is supposed to have been the Senate Finance Committee. You got Bert Stedman, you got Senator Natasha von Imhoff, and uh, David Wilson here, and a couple of others. That It's the same people that have been there since 2018. So you know what the last two years have looked like. You've known the disastrous bills that have been passed out of the Senate Finance Committee. Remember, these are the final word when it comes to bills coming through. These are the ones that consolidate with the House, and they sit down and they discuss the final budget that comes through. Remember what happened last year. We had a $1,000 stimulus that was good. we were all looking forward to, and our PFD in October when we would normally see it. And it got into that final committee hearing with the House and the Senate to consolidate the final budget to be passed. And they completely stripped that $1,000 stimulus right back out of there again 
as if it didn't even exist. And it's just a handful of people that made that decision. Today, our Alaska House decided to, to go ahead and elect or vote in um, Louise Stutes as the new House Speaker. Uh, she is the Republican that went directly over to the Democrats the first day that they were in office and uh, down there in Juneau on the 19th of January. 24 days later, they have now formed a majority with Louis Stutes now in charge of it. Um, now mind you, repeat again, she's been the one caucused with the Democrat majority since day one. The, the, the other 19 legislators out there, you should say 17 with two independents, but we know where that all leans towards. We got Representative Kelly Merrick is the one that went from the Republican side of the House and she voted with the Democrats and Independents today and handed the power right back over to the Democrats once again in the House. So here we've got the Senate who has reformed with some pretty good strong committees out there uh, handling the different issues that are there in the Senate that they're dealing with. But the final money that comes through, how much it's going to be, and everything else is going through the hands of the people that were not in this room today hearing the overview from the Department of Revenue. Only Senator David Wilson was there. This is what we call representation by our legislators that we elected to be in Juneau. Uh, I don't see any representation going on here. David Wilson's big excuse in the very beginning of all of this is, is, well, they've been here since 2018. We've been down this rodeo, this clown car path once before. We already know what's going on. It's really not that important whether they're here or not to be able to participate in this meeting that they had tonight. Basically, this is all supposed to be transparency for us, the public. That's the reason why it's held at 5.30 at night when it started, and now it's almost 7 o'clock at night. They wanted to make sure that Alaskans get a chance to hear this stuff. Well, lo and behold, we've now all got to hear it. And uh, But, you know, it, it, they were supposed to be slides. There was uh, 29 pages of slides that they had. I provided the link in, in both the top of the post and in the comments in several times, making sure that you guys got to see it. That to where to you get to see those slides because the big white screen in the back of the, the thing there, that big white screen, was where we were supposed to be seeing all of these slides coming up. Well, it's so light, it's so bright, you can't see what's on that screen. I'm sitting here right in front of it and can't see what's on that screen. So please go as. Uh, I would suggest if you didn't get a chance to watch this and you're just watching my tail end in right now, is to go to click that link to those slides and go and review through them. They presented it from start to finish, the way those slides go through. It was really amazing getting to hear what they had to say. As we have noticed over the last six years, they, they did spend a lot of time going over the permanent fund dividend. I'd also like to point out David Wilson brought up a very good question there when it came to our permanent fund dividends and the applications and people that are registered to vote. They had said, I think, I believe it said, don't quote me on this, but I believe they said they had 600 fraudulent people fill out applications. Um, and every time one of those applications is filled out, because of the way our election system is, is set up right now, which they're addressing with the bill HB 39, or SB 39, Senate Bill 39, um, about the permanent fund dividend automatically registering you to vote. SB 39 is working towards making it so that if you want to be registered, you just got to check mark the box. It won't let you go any further if you don't check mark a box, either yes or no. 
the big controversy that we're hearing from mainstream media about this is, is this voter suppression because people got to choose which box they're going to click. Either yes or no. They want it automatically done. Well, if you look at it as we found 600 fraudulent PFT applications, that means there's 600 fraudulent voters that are put onto our register uh, rolls for our voter registration. And so if we got 105% voter registration enrollment here in Alaska. Typical state is around 70 to 80% of their populace, voting population is actually registered to vote. We have 105%. So we got serious issues when it comes to our elections. And David Wilson made a good point during this conversation today that, and he couldn't, and the, the Department of Revenue head there could not answer the question. He said he would get back to him with that in writing. I would love to see what that response is. David Wilson, if you come and watch this later on today, that's my question I got for you is, is I want to see what uh, the, he had to say about whether or not those people that fraudulently filled out their PFDs were removed from the voter registration because that means that they fraudulently registered themselves the vote um, because it's automatically done on your application. SB 39, like I said, is only going to change it so that it's no longer an automatic enrollment. It is just you got to check a box. Repoint out again, 15% increase in uh, collection for child support because the stimulus given by the CARES Act and the extra unemployment is all garnishable. So I hope every Alaskan is happy to hear that the money that our government took from our paychecks went towards paying someone else's child support for them. I hope you all really appreciate that knowledge and fact that I had just given out here right now. It really is an eye-opener when it comes right down to saying, where did our money go? Well, you can hear where it's going, just like most of the things we hear in Anchorage when it came to the CARES Act money. It goes directly to the special interest. Now, with the House forming, they kind of brought this up a little bit in the conversation that they talked about today. The House forming, they, they've got that new uh, Heroes Act or whatever they're calling that next bill, that they the, the $1.9 trillion, which they want to double that to, to push through. That $1.9 trillion that's currently in the House being renegotiated and uh, will be coming out. While, while they're holding these sham impeachment trials, this is one of those things that they're hiding out behind the scenes that news media is not reporting on, that the House is working on this bill. You know, the House that has not put out anything in the last four years that has produced anything, that House... So here we are, we're currently going to be listening to, like I said, we, we watched what they had to say here today, I, let me gain my thought here, we watched what they were having to say today to, from the Department of Revenue about the state and capital budget where they have made a bunch of cuts, uh, a bunch of savings due to consolidating computer programming, taking over what humans used to do, like scanning in the PFTs and data entry on that stuff. It's now all done by computer. No, it's not even done by hand. So if you fill out the paper PFD form and mail it in, it's all done by a uh, machine now that reads it all. So it eliminated people's jobs, different kind of savings like that that was uh, done. Um, but I'm going to point out, just for emphasis here, it was only David Wilson inside of that room out of the committee members that should have been there. No Stedman, no Imhoff, none of the ones that are supposed to be sitting inside of that room. They were not there, not present. And David Wilson gave them an excuse. Well, they've been around since 2018 in this exact same committee. So they didn't need to be there. Anyways, you guys all have a great night. Um, if you caught my last video, you caught the tail end of it. Today is my special day. My kiddo kind of made a joke that uh, I should be wearing my birthday suit for uh, the today. And I looked at her and said I'd never be allowed on Facebook again after that. 
So, uh, anyways, you guys all have a great day. Go to my website, politidic.com. Click that support button. If you want to give me a, a great birthday gift for today, just go there and make a small donation. $5, work your way up as much as you can afford. All proceeds go right back into expanding what I'm doing. Keep upgrading the equipment, making sure i got high-quality microphones, cameras, televisions to broadcast from, computers that have the ability to actually connect to these things, and uh, getting the studio finished up. But one of these days, I'm going to find the time to go and cut the material. I got it all now. I just haven't had the chance to actually put the final pieces together in here. And uh, But you guys all have a great day, and uh, I hope you enjoy your evening. See you tomorrow.